What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. I am your host, Justin Dixon, and excited to have Sean Winslow on the pod today. Uh, Sean grew up in Vermont to entrepreneurial parents and, and family. Uh, he started out his entrepreneurial journey with a lemonade stand and knew that if he wanted uh, things in his life like a bike, he needed to work hard to get it. Uh, didn't go down the entrepreneurial route right away. He went into finance and investing uh, after going to college and before moving into uh, acquiring uh, some small three three family, they call it in Boston, triplex uh, up to 20 units in the first year or so before jumping into larger deals. His first large deal was almost 200 units. Uh, we talk a lot about his mindset and how he made that shift from you know growing up in, entre- in an entrepreneurial household to going to school and kind of work in the nine to five and then shifting out into now being uh you know a full-time real estate investor uh so stay tuned to the pod and let, let's welcome an end to the show do you love your job but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks if so you've come to the right place In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. Awesome, man. Sean, welcome to the show. Great to have you on the pod, man. Hey, Justin. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, no, let's uh, let's jump right in. So, you know, give us a quick overview of who you are and what you're uh, what you're up to in real estate and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, man. I'll take it. I'll take it back a little ways just to kind of give the listeners a feel for why I'm doing what I'm doing now. Yeah. So, um, like a way back actually. So when I when I was a kid, I grew up with I grew up in a small town in Vermont to a family of entrepreneurs, business owners. Um, you know, back then they called themselves small business owners, not entrepreneurs. But uh, right. I I digress from that. But uh, um, anyways, so like that's what I was conditioned from a young age, right? So you know, I had the lemonade stand. And then I had, you know, lawn care, mow lawns, you know, I'm from the Northeast, so I also had snow removal. Yeah. And I just had that, you know, entrepreneurial spirit of like, all right, if you want to make some money, like I wanted a bike, I'm not a new mountain bike. And I was told, well, I got to, I got to pay for half at least. That's when I started mowing. So I had that, I'm mowing lawns. So that's when I really started, you know, just changing the mindset of like, you got to go out, make the money, you know, you know, the, the, the term, you know, take the bull, the bull by the horn. So, right. I had I was conditioned in that way, and then I think what happens to a lot of people is you know you go to you go to high school, you get told you need to do well there so you can get into a good college, and that's what I did. Got to a good went to a college, and then was told I need to you know do really well so I can get a good you know W two nine to five job, right? And that's what I did. Um, studied finance, um, ended up at a a large investment firm in Boston, and worked there for. Okay. Yeah, you know, around seven years. Um, so traditional investments, very different from what we're about to talk about, right? Right, right. And, you know, it was great. I love investing. You know, I love helping people build wealth. But at the end of the day, I just realized what I was offering at at that firm was not the most, you know, one, tax efficient, cost effective, you know, or just it just was not the best way to, to grow wealth. It was it was great for the portfolio managers, fund managers you know, sales guys, of course, they made, you know, and I just, it just didn't sit well. So I knew I needed to make a change. Um, and before I made the change, I was, I also realized that change shouldn't just be like, I, you know, I want to do a different job to make money. It should be like, no, how can I create something that supports a life that I want to have? So I thought about what are the two things I want in life? Well, obviously everyone knows it it costs to do things. So you need some type of income. Yep. The other thing I wanted was time. I wanted to be able to do the things I wanted with the people I wanted when I wanted. And so I was like, okay, think about people who have that already. And so I, I thought of some people, friends, um, former colleagues, uh, former you know, family members, friends, people, just acquaintances, right? Yeah. And all the ones that had that that dynamic, like enough money to do some awesome things and enough time to do them when they wanted, they were all in real estate. So got it. That's that's when I want to make the change. And I, I can stop here if you want, if you want to ask any questions or I can continue on. Yeah, no, we can we can unpack some of that. And I'm curious kind of a little bit about, you know, your upbringing and kind of having those entrepreneurial parents uh, and family members like. 
how did you kind of shift from, okay, I, if I want a bike as a kid, I need to have a lemonade stand and, or mow, uh, mow X amount of lawns to get the bike, right? Um, to then, you know, you kind of got, I'll use brainwashed when you went to high school and college because that's, but that's like what everybody, uh, you know, thinks, right? I grew up in a, you know, different environment. My Both my parents worked, you know, for the man and, you know, the, the goal was to work for 30, 40 years, have enough money in your 401k so that you hopefully can retire comfortably, uh, you know, at the end of that. Right. And so you kind of had the ideal scenario where you had entrepreneurial parents that kind of, you know, figured it out. Then you went to college and then you got the job. And then when did you kind of think about, okay, was it a moment or like, how did that kind of mindset shift going back to like, okay, I need to do something different with my time and my, my effort. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was when I, you know, there was a couple of things. One was, I just felt like I wanted more, you know? And I, I didn't want to work for someone else's dream. I wanted to work for my own dream. And don't get me wrong. Like there's some people that love that type of security, that type of job. Um, but that just was not me. And I just felt like, you know, I was just not getting enough out of life, just, you know, clocking in, clocking out every day. And, and it brought me back to, um, my younger years when it was, that was how much fun that was. Cause I would get friends to mow their lawns and I would take, you know, a cut of of what they made you know it was just like it was a game man it was just like yeah. it was fun it was exhilarating and i was in control you know it's cliched but i was essentially in control of my destiny right so it, that just kind of invigorated me and then on the other side of it i also it brought me back to something uh my grandfather told me who was an entrepreneur successful entrepreneur and that was and he loved the stock market so it's kind of funny that i got into real estate because he was big stock market um got opponent it. Um, but he told me that all the real estate he owned, cause he, he also owned real estate. Um, but that, that would be his retirement, that it would pay for his retirement. So those two things kind of mm. clicked and I was like, this is what I need to do. So that's kind of how the mind, mind shift changes. And, and, and also like just seeing the people I worked with, like, that's not the future I wanted. Right. Like, yeah, they were making decent, pretty good right. money. Right. But it was like, they're always nervous. Like, am I hitting my, my, my numbers, my sales goals? Um, you know, if from the fund management side, am I like, is it performing well enough? They're just beholden to essentially the man, like you said, and, and they could get, you know, let go fired at the drop of a drop of a time, you know? Yeah. I love when people talk about nine to five job career as secure and, yeah. you know, for those of you who don't know, I've been in recruiting for 16 years and worked for small and large companies and, you know, publicly traded and private companies. And when the company needs to make their number, um, you are just a line item on a spreadsheet and then an expense, uh, you know, even if you're in sales. So, you know, I've seen a lot of great professional, hardworking people get told they are out of a job um, because the company needs to survive and needs to thrive. And unfortunately, they are it's at their expense. So um, you can be, you know, the hardest working employee, show up every day to work, don't take vacations, don't take sick days. And you could come in one day and be like, uh, you have two weeks to find a new job. Um, and so it's to your point, like, and you're always chasing the, the dream, chasing the number, especially if you're in a, you know, business development, uh, you know, environment, there's always a quota to hit or, or a target. Um, so it's not as, as, as secure as people feel or think that it is. Uh, and sometimes being an entrepreneur, yes, it's very, uh, r risky and, you know, it, it's a different kind of risk and stress, but, um, you know, I'd rather work a hundred hours for myself than 40 hours for somebody else. Right. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, kind of the transition from when you went, you were, you know, in the finance world, working for a company to jumping into doing what you're doing now. And, and so I guess talk about kind of the point at which you kind of made the break and then, you know, what, what did you do leading up to that to kind of set yourself up for that kind of, I'm going to quit my nine to five. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny cause I was still partially conditioned to, um, you know, educate yourself like formally before you did anything. So yeah. the first thing I did was, you know, I reached out to friends that were already in the real estate industry and they all, um, they all referred me to Boston University's, um, real estate finance program. Okay. And this is a, a, a night program. Um, and 
again, they were coming from, they were in real estate, but there it was a nine to five job, right? They're working for private equity firms. Um, and, and so it was still, they, they were still in that mindset too. So I, I took that, it was like a year, year and a half program, I want to say, okay. um, partially, you know, it, there was, you know, it was accredited. Um, and, and it was a, don't get me wrong. I do not regret it. It was, it was awesome. I learned like all the teach all the teachers were people that were, um, currently practicing, you know, real estate investing. So it, it's not like you're learning for someone who's doing it like five, 10 years ago. Right. So I learned a lot of great stuff. Um, but at the same time, it kind of slowed me down. I, you know, I, I could have found a more, could have found a more practical way to do it. Right. And <laughs> again, it's funny because when I completed that program, I was still in the mindset, okay, let's, let's find, let's go work for a private equity shop. Right. But still like, let's go get a nine to five, but instead of in, you know, financial services, let's do it in, you know, real estate. Yeah. And, and then the, but the funny part is that towards the end of it, I met this kid that was also in, in that, this program. And he told me, he's like, yeah, I work for this, this syndicator out of Boston, but I'm trying to get out of that. You know, I might go get my master's. I want to work for like, you know, private equity. And I was like, well, what's a, what's a syndicator? Like I hadn't heard that term before. Um, I knew what private placements were because we offered them at my, at the firm I worked for, but I, like the word syndication. I was like, what is that? And he goes, oh, it's like where you, you know, private placement, pool money. Oh, I was like, I know what that is. He's like, yeah, you can do it with real estate. And he says, you pull people's money together and you go buy big, big properties. Right. And it was funny. He was, he was taking this finance program to get out of that. And now I wanted to get into that. I was like, yeah, that's right. exactly what I want to do. And that's what I need to do. Um, and so then I was kind of brainstorming fear, like, how do I do this? Because I can't go do that and work for my my firm, um, because I was licensed at the time, you know, series seven, oh, yeah. six. So, you know, conflict of interest and I can't raise money for them and then raise money for myself. Just can't do that. Right. Um, so I was like, well, how can I, like, I need a little bit of a runway. I can't just, you know, stop cold Turkey here in my job yeah. and my, my income. So then I s- figured, let's just start buying small multis. Uh, okay. so I did that. Um, and it's just, man, it's the power of like, w- I'm sure listeners, if you're familiar with this industry, you've heard the the phrase, a law of the first deal. Um, and if you haven't, it simply just means it's like, once you do your first deal, like it just seems like the next one's just flow. Like the first one's the hardest to get done. And it's so true because I bought a, um, a, a three unit, so a triplex, or if you're from the Boston area, they call it three family. Um, so bu- bu- bought a three family. It's funny. There's so many terms in real estate and they all listen to the same thing. Uh, so bought a three family, bought it with a buddy. Um, and then I bought a, that was in July. And then August of that year, I bought a duplex that I house hacked. Um, and then probably three months after that, yeah, three months after that, I bought another, um, three family. And then four or five months after that, we cash out refied the first property we bought and bought another three family. And then after that, we bought from that property. This, this is, this is a tip too. Whenever you're buying so- something, ask like whether you're buying direct to seller or from a broker agent, ask like, does the seller have any more properties? Right. I did that and they ended up having 14 more units. So then I ended up two months after that closing, buying the rest of his portfolio at 14 units. Um, and then from there, um, which I can get more into how this happened. But then from there, I bought a 197 unit. Um, prob- I was two months later, or no, no, a little more than that, three three months later. And then after that, we bought a uh, 156 uh, student housing. So it was about 519 beds. And that was like three months later. So it just, it's crazy how this all snowballs. And I can get into like how I got into the bigger stuff, but it's just a lot yeah, of no. first deal. It's really true. Let's uh let's let's dig into kind of that transition from the small stuff, the three family or triplex or whatever you want to call it, to to the big stuff. But before we do that, um, we're gonna take a quick sponsor break and we will be right back. Whether you're trying to hire a full time employee or a contractor to fill a gap, Hire Tomorrow can help. Hire Tomorrow is a boutique recruitment firm that has successfully filled sales and marketing, human resources and technology positions with companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500. If you're struggling to find the right talent, check out HireTomorrow.com or reach out to 
recruiting at hiretomorrow.com to see how they can help. All right, we are back with Sean Winslow. So before the break, we were talking, Sean was walking us through kind of his transition from starting out with a, a triplex or, or as they say in Boston, a three family uh, property. And now he has kind of, it sounds like he's acquired 20 some units in a pretty short amount of time. Uh, before we jump into kind of how you got into the big stuff for when you were doing these small deals, was that still while you were a W2 employee? Uh, and if so, where did you get the capital to to do all these deals? Was it your own or did you kind of have some some partners that you worked with? Yeah. So I was still a W2 employee. Um, so, you know, it shows like that you can do it. It's just, you know, you might have to late, late evenings, weekends, yeah. early mornings, but it's it's easy to do, guys. And then to my point of the law, the first deal earlier, once you get going and build that team, it, the next deals just flow so much easier from all aspects, right? I'm not saying this is an easy business, but it definitely gets easier as you go because you build up yeah. that team, you know what to expect um, for the most part. You know, real estate there definitely throws you wrenches all the oh. wrenches at you all the time. But uh, yeah, so um, the second part of your question, so at, it was W-2 um, and then the mo- money-wise, the first two deals were my me and my partner's money. The okay. third, third deal we brought in... Um, hard money or pr- private money. The fourth deal was that cash out refi. So got to put that into it. And then the 14 unit, we brought in some private investors. And then obviously once we got into the bigger stuff, we syndicated those. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting when you get into the real estate game and you start peeling back the onion, there's so many creative finance ways that you just have no exposure to in your traditional kind of nine to five or traditional kind of schooling, you know, cash out refis. Yeah. If you have a house, you can do some type of a cash out refi, but there's so many cool ways to, to kind of get started, um, as an active investor, which is what you were doing as a W2 or even as a passive investor, uh, obviously there, there's other ways to get into it. So, so talk us through, I guess, the transition from small deals to these larger hundred plus unit deals. Um, and then at what point did you, you know, comfortable enough that you had the kind of financial foundation to say, I can actually do this full time and I'm going to jump out and, and quit my W-2. Yeah. Yeah. So the trip, the trans, so I always wanted to do the bigger stuff out of the gate just because I came from, you know, an institutional background and I just knew the, you know, the power of the economies of scale of the bigger stuff. And it just made sense to me, right? Like, not only can you pay for a third party property management, but it also affords on site staff. And I just made, so much sense to me plus just being able to scale yeah um you know when you're doing re- renovations you know obviously you can get deals on on higher or higher volumes of of product right so i knew i wanted to do that but then back to that point of well, i couldn't just do it at because i was licensed under finra i just right. couldn't do that um so i once i got to the point where i felt i was comfortable enough to have enough cash flow um that's when you know i left and and made that decision um, to, to just go all in. Um, and at that point I also knew like, and this is funny cause I've, I've never really thought this way before until this moment. And I really can't even tell you why it might've been just from hearing it on podcasts or books, but yeah, I just knew I needed a mentor or someone to guide me. Like this is a big step, like from investing in, you know, you know, four units and triplexes and duplexes even though it makes more sense to go bigger, it's still a different game. Um, uh, it's a mind, mindset shift, right? Yeah. You, like, you almost feel like you're you're not supposed to do it yet, right? Like there's a lot of people that, whether it's passive or active, you kind of feel like, let me start with a single family or let me do a flip, right? Because I'm not, I'm not ready to do 100 units. And then, you know, you talk to other people and it's like, no, 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 just go big because to your point, the economy is a scale. If you go to 100 units, you have on-site staff, you can, you know, utilize different financing and all that fun stuff. So, um, so yeah, keep, keep, keep going. I'm kind of curious kind of how that transition happened. And then, um, I guess, talk us a little bit about what you're doing now. Cause obviously for those of you who may or may not know, I was on your podcast. Um, so, you know, you've got a podcast out there and then just talk us through kind of your, what you're doing now with your, your firm. Yeah. Yeah. So the next step was, right, I need to find who's this, who's going to be this mentor. 
And it goes back to what I mentioned before, when I when, before I decided in real estate, I wanted to build something around my life um, that that fit my life, you know, right, and the life I wanted to live. And yeah. so that's the angle I took from the men with a mentor too. I needed to find someone that was living the life that I that I wanted and got it, and, and doing the things I wanted. It would I just didn't want to find someone who was just a successful investor. I wanted to find someone who was a successful investor in the stuff I wanted to invest in, and he was had success in his life in the life that I wanted to create. Right, right. So through, I don't know, networking and podcasts and, you know, get down that podcast and YouTube rabbit hole. Honestly, I probably couldn't even track back how I, how I found this individual, but, you know, I got there. And what I decided to do is I took this from um, from what I, I used to do in finance. You, you get someone's attention. Personally, for me, it was write, handwriting a letter. Everyone gets emails. Everyone gets calls. Everyone gets DMs on social media, right? Um, so found his address and, and wrote him a handwritten letter, um, just saying how, like, appreciated the content that he put out, you know, he's living the life that I aspire to have one day. Um, and I let him know what I could offer. And if there's any way I, you know, I could help him with anything he needed, uh, I would do it for free. Right. And I sent that letter to him and I got a call. Cause I obviously put put my my phone number in there for sure, and uh, got got a call, <laughs> and he he just laughed because he said that was um, he said that that was his move that's that's what he does so it, it really hit home for him and yeah and then he that's it. he was my one of my first mentors and partnered on one of the earlier deals with him and yeah it changed the trajectory of of my career for sure. Um, because I got to not only, because as you know, Justin, I'm sure you've told the listeners like this, this game is about like team and partnerships. Yeah. yeah you're not doing, a, you're not doing a 200 unit deal, deal by yourself on the, fir- at least definitely not on the first one. Right. Yeah. Well, and even on the 10th one, you still have to work with lawyers and, you know, brokers and yeah. insurance companies. Like there, there's, even if you can raise the money and you've got the track record yourself, um, you still have to partner with other people to execute that deal. Right. So, yeah. And to that point, like I, not only did I get him to mentor me, but I got access to his team. So you mentioned the attorneys, you know, um, well, I found the brokers cause that we can get more into that. Cause that's kind of my, my niche because it, that's coming from my background, but yeah, his, his attorneys, um, you know, property management, all that good stuff. You know, I got access construction management. I got access to all of that. Yeah. And it's just made, made the difference. All right, we're back. Sorry, we had a little bit of technical difficulties there, uh, but we're back with Sean. So before we were kind of cut out a little bit, we were talking about, you know, you were getting a mentor and, you know, I think we were talking about kind of the power of having somebody that is has been there, done that for a lot of reasons. And in, in, in the real estate game, uh, especially large multi, you need a team to take down these big deals, right? And And also it's not only the team, but you need capital, you need to find the deals, you need to have legal draft these documents. So there's, there is a, a team game, uh, kind of associated with, with large multifamily stuff. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit, um, and talk about, you know, we're, we're recording this in kind of mid February, 2023, you know, interest rates are high, inflation is, is high, uh, you know, fears of recession and all that fun stuff. Um, I guess let's talk a little about your kind of outlook for 2023 um let's talk a little bit about are you still looking for deals what's your focus uh with your own firm um and then we can kind of dig into some other stuff yeah yeah so that's the the question of the year question of i guess the next decade right is what what's going to happen what's what's the fed going to do yeah Um, what are some other countries going to do what what's you know the market going to do in in general and man, it's it's one of those things that we can't predict. So I think you always got to be looking for deals. So um, we're we're still underwriting, we're still building relationships with brokers, and you know we're out there hunting for deals. And it might be it might be harder. You know, everyone's talking about you know that this is going to be the, the the time that changes your life, changes your career because you're going to find deals of the of this of like the century. And maybe that will happen, but maybe not. And and, and the reason why it, it might not happen is because one, every we're, we're all going to be hunting for those deals. So, is there yeah. is there 
really, are you really going to, unless you go direct the seller, are you really going to scoop it up for, for a song? You know, that, that's, you know, we'll see. Right. And I don't think we're really going to see more opportunities present themselves probably until Q2, Q3 of this year, just because, yeah, people might be feeling pain right now, but there's a lagging effect to it. Right. Like yeah. they'll take the pain at the beginning because they're not just going to throw on the towel. They want to get through this and obviously try not to have a blemish you know, on their track record. So they're going to do right. whatever they can, but then there's going to be a point where it's just too much pain and either they're just going to have to get out or their investors are going to make them get out. And, and I, I don't think we're at that point yet. Um, yeah. Now a lot of, you know, and I'm not an economist, but by, by any sense, so don't, don't take this like it's written in stone, but a lot of indicators point, point towards, you know, something coming in the April, May, May time, time frame. Um, and so we'll see if that happens. Right. But, but I, I think the fed's going to do what they, what they were saying, right. There's probably gonna be another 25 basis point hike. This is what the, the Ford yield curve has predicted anyways. And then it'll kind of just, you know, hang steady, um, for the remainder of the year. And then in 2024, they, it, the, the Ford curve, um, predicts that they'll, they'll taper back, you know, so they'll, yeah. they'll take the foot off the gas and, and lower the rates. Um, but to answer that, the beginning of that question is, yeah, we're still looking for deals, 100%. Yeah, and right now, like, you know, I've even seen it, you know, so far this year, you know, I've had a few brokers reach out to me directly. Um, and I think they're going to have to do a little bit more work uh, when they do have deals because there are going to be, I think there are a lot of buyers that are on the sidelines because uh, I think 2023 is kind of what I've been saying is it's, it's like the year of the operator. So if you bought deals in the last year or two, and you're on variable rate debt, and maybe you didn't buy a rate cap because nobody anticipated rates going up as high as they have, and definitely not as fast as they have. Um, you're going to be really hyper focused on operating your current portfolio, whether it's one or twenty or thirty properties, right? Because you know you may have had a pause distribution, so your investors are a little bit more anxious. Um, so, you know, I've talked to a couple of people in the group that I'm in um, that have acquired deals and. I was like, hey, are you guys still looking? They're like, no. Like, they're not even like they're telling brokers like, hey, I'm I'm off. I'm on the sidelines for right now because they are hyper focused on making sure that the deals that they do have are performing as best as they possibly can. And once they get those kind of stabilized and, and maybe we are into that kind of Q2, Q3, Q4 time frame, then they'll start to pick their heads up. Um, but I've had brokers reach out to me and say, hey, I, I got I have this deal. Can you just write an offer because the seller is not realistic in what their mm -hmm. sale price expectations are, right? So I think there's still some balancing that's going on between what sellers think they can get for their property and also what brokers are communicating, right? Because, you know, the market shows what the price or what the property is worth. So yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. Uh, you know, I, I'm still actively looking at deals. Um, I guess are there specific markets that you're uh, targeting now or maybe avoiding now given... Um, you know, that, that maybe there are some different things happening in those markets that you're kind of either more attracted to or less attracted to. Yeah. Before I get into that, to, to add on to the point you said, that's one of the, one of the main reasons I'm still looking at deals. It's not because I may think I'm going to find something. Yeah. There's the potential I could. So that's also a reason, but the main reason is to continue the relationship building with the brokers. Yeah. And so once deals start to come, they remember that I was there through thick and thin and also I'll just be top of mind because we've been talking this whole time. So I will not tell a broker I'm, I'm not buying. I, I tell them I'm always buying for the right deal. Yeah. Um, and, but to those, to the point of your, your colleagues, yeah, we're focused on the operation side too, for sure. Cause that's, this is the time should always be focused, but this is the time we really need to be focused, make sure everything's tight, you know, not overspending on anything. Um, so I do agree with that. And now to, to answer your question about markets, we still, we haven't really changed per se. Um, so again, when I first started, it was in the Northeast. Um, and then we started syndicating, we stopped looking in the Northeast. So the only thing that's changed is now we're looking at the Northeast again, and we'll look for some smaller stuff just because we, we are here boots on the ground, we have relationships. Yeah. We know the markets, we ha have relationships with, with banks, um, with lender, local lenders. And I think this is the time where those really shine. So that's why we're booking in this area and some of these areas I just know really well and I know they're you know uh recession not resistant but resilient and so we're looking here but we're also looking at our other target markets which are 
North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So we look at um, obviously the major demographic points, right? So you like population growth, um, household income growth, um, household value growth, job growth, you know, a low crime rate. Um, and one of the things we look at a lot too from the population growth standpoint is U-Haul data. So U-Haul obviously is a pub- publicly traded com- company, yeah. so they put out quarterly reports. So we'll look at where is that net migration. Um, and those three states I mentioned are always in the last couple of years have been in the, the top 10, if not top five. So yeah. um, obviously there's some other big hitters out there like Florida and, and Texas where, where you're at. So that that's kind of the stuff we look at. So we have, so we're still Carolinas, Georgia, um, and then in the Northeast, specifically in the Northeast, we like New Hampshire because it's, Interesting. um, it's, um, landlord friendly or as, oh, there you go. or as Massachusetts, Rhode Island, definitely not. And then there is not. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. No, that's fair. correct. So I want to kind of transition to kind of the, the final parts of, of the pod. Um, and you know, my audience is the traditional, I'm a nine to fiver. I love my job. I make a lot of money, but I want different options, right? Uh, outside of the traditional 401k or the stock market. Cause they, they want to, you know, maybe generate some additional passive income, uh, where they just want a couple of different like, uh, options for, for investing. So, you know, put yourself back in your W2 days and, you know, what would you kind of give somebody, what advice would you give them, you know, as a good first step, if they want to start a, a, an, a passive real estate investing journey, uh, obviously listen to, to this podcast is probably a good step, but what, what do you think is a good kind of step for them to kind of get more comfortable in, you know, investing in these deals? Yeah. Um, first is, yeah, definitely listen to this podcast because Dustin's a rock star and I know he's going to bring on, on, on rock stars too. So to my point of earlier mentors, like a mentor doesn't have to be something formal like I did. It can be a podcast, it, you know, it can be YouTube yeah. channel, a book, right? Um, that's a great way to start. And then once you really get into it, to me, it's more about if I was a limited partner, like from my standpoint, um, we're, we're GP, we're general partners. So the underwriting comes the, you know, the market and deal level and we do a lot of hours and hours of work on that per deal. Right. But from a limited partner, I'm more concerned about the, un, the due diligence and the underwriting on the operators, the general partner themselves. Yeah. Not necessarily a deal because if you can trust the operator and when I say operator and general partner, it's the same thing. Um, and you can trust the operator, you know, they're going to then present you a solid deal. Right. And, you know, if you don't trust them, anyone can show you a deal that looks good, right? This is just numbers. Like it's Excel. You can make, yeah. You can make it look good. And when I, yeah. when I'm, when people ask me about underwriting, the first thing I say is, you know, what the whole thing about underwriting is trying to kill the deal. If you, if you can kill it, and especially if you can kill it pretty easily, move on. Yeah. Um, if you can't kill it, then I bet you have a deal. Um, and so that's just my point of like anyone can, of those numbers like you get emotionally attached and make it look good so it's more about really finding out who the operator is you know ask for their track record and and if they're starting out that, that's not that doesn't mean that the no-go right like who are they partnered with that has a track record? right and who is that person um and what are their morals what do they stand for ask them like when has something gone wrong and and what did you do like you know it's it, if something happened, like, are you more worried about, you know, providing a return or, or, or protecting the, the investor's hard earned money? And, yeah. and, you know, for some people, the answer could go either way, but if you know who you are, you, you want to make sure you get that right answer. You want to be aligned. Like there's a, operators out there that have different goals and you just want to make sure you align. Yeah, no, that's fair. And to your point about being emotionally attached to, to properties, I remember when I was first starting to underwrite deals you try to make a deal work because you're like, oh, this deal looks awesome. You know, it's in a great location and you're just like, oh yeah, it should, it should work. Right. It should be great. Um, but you just can't, you can't make it work. And it's like, you learn very quickly to not waste your time on, uh, uh, you know, the emotional side of trying to find a deal. So, um, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. You gotta, all right. Gotta set up that buy box, you know? And yeah. If it, if it hits, move on. If it doesn't, then just throw that away and on to the next. Yeah, it'd be super rigid. You'd be like, hey, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. I'm uh, on to the next one. Don't waste time. So, uh, all right, let's transition to the kind of final phase here. Uh, I've got a three-pack of questions I ask every guest. So let's jump into the first one. 
Uh, what's one piece of advice that you got uh, when you started or has helped you on your real estate investing journey? Yeah, um, it's probably just to think bigger. Uh, don't don't think always so small. Like, and there's kind of a twofold um, ad- advice there. It was think bigger and like if you're comfortable, one you're not thinking big enough, and two you're not going to grow. Yeah. Um, so if you're uncomfortable, you're doing the right thing, and that kind of that changed everything for me because. You know, when I first started, it was like, you know, a big deal. It's anything from 75 units and upwards. So at first, you know, looking at like the 75 to 100. And then my first big deal ended up being just under 200, right? So yeah. I opened my eyes. And, you know, when brokers would first send you deals, you get nervous. Is this too big? Should I be doing this? And then it just turned into like, no, I first I just need to get this, make sure it's a deal. And then two, I need to get it locked up. And I, I have parts and pieces in the team to make this work. Yeah, and that, that just changed everything for me. It take it takes the same amount of effort to underwrite a seventy five unit deal as it does a two hundred seventy five unit deal. It's just a matter of do you have the capital behind you to to take down a, a big deal. That's really the biggest the biggest challenge. Um, awesome. What uh, what's your favorite business or real estate book that you're into right now? Ooh, that I'm into right now. Um, that's a great question. Real estate or business book that I'm into right now? Um, well. I'll give, matter if I give two, this might be cheating, but I'll give, sure. I'll, I'll give two, uh, from a real estate book. It's called the real, real estate game. Okay. Um, yeah, um, purview is the last, last name is purview. He was a real estate investor out of Boston and he was, he was also a Harvard business school professor that he taught real estate and okay. it's just a solid, really good book. You know, and he's able to explain it just in like layman terms that just makes sense. So I would check that book out. Um, and then in terms of a, of a business book, uh, the e- E-Myth is, I've always loved the E-Myth. Oh yeah, um, great book. Um, talks about systems, you know, and working not in your business, but on your business. Yeah, that's a, it's a great book for anybody that's like interested in starting a business or, or anything like that. It's definitely, uh, definitely opened my eyes as I started my entrepreneurial journey for sure. So all right, last question here. Uh, if you hit your financial freedom number, meaning you you can live an amazing life just off of passive income from your investments, what would you do? So I don't know if I'll ever hit the numbers because I, I feel like if I hit it, I'll want it. It'll be a new number, right? And I'll be more. I just, <laughs> yeah, I just, and it's not because I want more or need more. It's just, it's more because of the game. Just, it just keeps me alive, right? And yeah, um, I think I'll just be pushing for more. Just yeah, obviously not for the number of the money, but just to feel like I'm actually doing something that you know bring purpose to my life, right? I yeah, feel like you're not going to sit on a beach for the next uh, thirty years. Yeah, that's just not me. I think I'd get bored. Like I, I go on vacation sometimes that are those style, and I'm like bored and want to go do something. So yeah, um, you know, definitely get to a point where I'll probably peel back a little bit and have more time, right? You know, I like to travel. I like skiing. Um, yeah. And I like giving back. Like I want to, you know, part of our, so our company, Greenbrier Capital Group, part of our mission is to give back a minimum of 10% of profit every year to causes that mean something to us. So like the underground railroad project, you're not familiar with that. They combat, you know, human trafficking. Um, so that's, that's one, uh, children hunger. Um, and my partner, his, his fiance or his, excuse me, his wife's side of the family, um, from Venezuela. And so we want to kind of create a foundation there to help people get out of that, that area. So, um, that's probably stuff I'll focus more on, you know, as I hit a certain number. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. I, I, I really, uh, resonate with that for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, thanks for, for being on the show. How can people kind of get in touch with you? You mentioned your, your company, uh, Green Bar Capital, but what's uh, a good way to reach out if they're interested in learning about some of the deals you're working on? Yeah, so if you want to check out the website, it's greenbriarcg.com. Um, and then if you want to get in contact with me, the two best ways to do that are either on Instagram, that's Sean Wins, R-E-I, Sean spelled S-H-A-W-N, or you can find me on LinkedIn. That's the other best place to find me, Sean Wins, well on LinkedIn. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have all this stuff in the show notes, uh, listeners, so you don't have to jot down notes if you're driving. Hopefully, you're uh, you're not driving and texting. So, uh, Sean, man, thank you for uh, for being on the show. This has been uh, a lot of fun. Really appreciate it. 
Hey, Justin, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. I hope everybody took something away from this episode. And I've got another one dropping pretty soon, so keep listening. Uh, and remember, you don't have to quit your career just to build a passive real estate investment portfolio uh, with multiple streams of income. You just need to take some action and listening to this podcast is a great uh, first step. So thanks for being on and we'll see you soon. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please leave a written review. I read every review as it helps me serve you better. If you're listening to this podcast, it means that you want to grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.